today our history of Rossmore by discussing two names, Tice and Naphtali. Each one involves two men, James W. Tice and Andrew Jackson Tice, and Joseph and Samuel Naphtali. We've heard about James W. Tice already. His name, of course, we're familiar with in the area. As far as the Naphtalis go, the only reference we have today is in the wife, Sarah Naphtali. We call it Sarah Nap. It became a railroad stop. You may recall that James W. Tice had obtained 373 acres from Innocencia Romero only to, dis to discover that the United States government would not recognize Innocencia's land grant. Tice, however, continued to occupy the land and claimed it as his own. It was discovered later, or at least claimed to, by Carpenter, who had bought part of the Rancho San Ramon, that his land was part of the San Ramon grant. So, he, so Tice had to rebuy the whole thing all over again for another $3,000. James W. Tice and Andrew Jackson Tice improved the property, built ranch houses, and developed a herd of cattle and horses and sheep. The 1857 tax bill listed 130 horses, 120 steers, and 171 sheep on the ranch. The Tice, of course, like all early settlers, were faced with squatters who would suddenly appear and claim a piece of the unfenced land as their own. There were a number of arguments and forced evictions from the Tice property. To confirm his ownership, James W. Tice climbed to the top of the hill at the entrance to Rossmore and there carved his initials and the date on the rock. And it remains today as a sign that Tice lived here. We have an early map of the Tice property. The limits were determined by various trees, rocks, buildings, and notable sites. One can see that in a few years, boundary disputes were sure to arise. This survey does show several buildings, the spring for which the valley is noted, and the creek. James W. Tice on this tax map showed that he had 357 acres and A.J. Tice had 111 acres. The Tices were not the most sociable of people. They did seem to get into trouble with their neighbors. They got involved with some cattle rustlers when stolen cattle appeared on their ranch. The rustlers were let out of jail on bail, waiting for trial. By the date of the trial, both the cattle and the rustlers had disappeared. Another incident of more serious nature occurred in 1862. James Tice was missing a mare. He felt that the McGee's in the adjacent ranch had stolen the horse. Tice confronted McGee at his ranch. McGee, with a shotgun in his hand, ordered Tice off the property. Tice drew his gun and shots were fired. Tice's bullet went through McGee's arm, through both lungs, and lodged in the other arm. Noting that McGee was dead, Tice mounted his horse and rode with all due speed to Martinez to report the accident to the sheriff. In the inquest that followed, Tice's claim of self-defense was accepted. He was found not guilty of murder. 
There is a sequel to this story. McGee's family and friends were not happy with the verdict. About a month later, while Tice was riding in his buggy along the dirt road, something mysteriously spoke his horse. Tice was thrown from the wagon and his shoulder was broken and he has stained bruises and lacerations. The cause of the accident was never determined, but Tice was more careful in the future. He would not discuss the incident. It was about this time that the Tices were at the high point. They controlled over a thousand acres and Tice even served on the grand jury. With the end of the Civil War in 1865, prices began to drop and the Tices found themselves in financial difficulty. Andrew Jackson Tice tried to kill himself while in San Francisco. He tried again on a trip to Oakland. Around this time, his grandson, only four years old, died. Saddened, he found, decided to seek solace at Smith's Watering Cure, a spa and drinking spot near Lake Tamascal. The next morning, he was found dead. This complicated the estate. Taxes were high, and James could not meet the death toll. He was sued for back taxes in 1869. Most of the land was sold, except for 117 acres, which were assigned to Yoriha Tice, Andrew Jackson's wife, to a James T. Mollett. Mollett only kept the land for a short period of time, and in 1874, Joseph Naphtali, a San Francisco lawyer, purchased the acreage. Joseph Naphtali was born in Prussia in 1842. He married Sarah and had a son, Samuel, who was born in 1874, the year he acquired the Tice property. Joseph brought, bought other properties, and by 1876, he controlled 2,600 acres. Joseph set out to make the ranch a profitable operation. He appointed John Nolan as ranch manager and hired a crew to evict the squatters. There were several court cases due to the tactics employed by Nolan. In one case, Joe Magnini built a cabin inside the fence on part of the wheat field. With gun in hand, Nolan forced McGagan to tear down the cabin. Megan sold, sued Nolan. The court decided that Nolan had not used the due process that legal means had allowed. Nolan lost the case, but Naganin was not allowed to return to the site. The great wheat boom in Contra Costa County was coming to the end in the early 1880s and Joseph Naphtali decided to switch to grapes and develop a wine industry. He hired M. M. Esteves of Napa to lay out the vineyards. Over two million vines were planted in what is now the shopping area and the Del Valle Shop. The winery was built on the hillside where Del Valle parking lot is now located. The grapes were crushed on the third floor, dropped into vats on the second floor, and stored in barrels in the caverns dug into, dug into the hillside. Here they were safe from the summer heat. A distillery was erected nearby for the making of brandy. There was storage for over 70,000 gallons tucked into the winery proper. In 1893, Naphtali added 10 acres of pears, five acres of apples, and 10 acres of almonds to his ranch. You can see the remains of the orchard in the springtime 
when the surviving trees blossom along the creek near the entrance gate. The offices of the ranch were at 460 Montgomery Street in San Francisco. The Naphthalis rarely came to Contra Costa. Their home was on Pacific Avenue in San Francisco. Joseph died in 1910 at the age of 68. By this time, his son Samuel had taken over. He had graduated from the University of California in electrical engineering in 1896. He was involved in several hydroelectric projects. He worked on the Lake Amador Dam and was vice president of the Great Western Power Company, which operated in Contra Costa County and the surrounding areas. They were serious rivals to the Pacific Gas and Electric Company at this period. Samuel and some of his friends became interested in the new electric motor and its use for railroad business. In 1910, Joseph Naphtali, Walter Arnstein, and Harry A. Mitchell formed the Oakland and Antioch Railroad. They set about raising the necessary three and a half million dollars by selling stock in the proposed rail line. Construction was begun at Oakland and at Bay Point in Contra Costa County. The road was built from 40th and Shafter Street up through Rock Ledge and into the Montclair area. Through a tunnel in Shepherd Canyon, the tracks emerged and descended Pinehurst to Moraga. Here it turned back north to reach Nap. Lafayette. From Bay Point, the line set out for Concord and Walnut Creek. BART uses this route today. In Walnut Creek, the rails were laid on California Avenue and Olympic Boulevard to join the line coming from Lafayette. From Bay Point, the tracks ran to West Pittsburgh and there, by way of a train ferry, it reached the northern shore and raced across the flatlands to Sacramento. The railroad never reached Antioch. Our principal interest is the spur line Naphtali built from Saranap to Danville. This was called the San Ramon Valley Railroad. Tice Valley Boulevard of today marks the tracks from Saranap to beyond the Jewish Community Center. Here the tracks began their climb along the right side of the valley to cross the Tice Valley Boulevard shortly after it passes Meadow Lane. By cutting a V in the hillside, it was able to pass under Crest Road and bridge the Southern Pacific tracks to come to the Danville Road at Creeling. This is now Iron Horse Estates. Samuel's main purpose for the railroad was to speed his wine to market. At the point where the Rite Aid drugstore now sits, a curve of tracks led to the winery. Here the barrels of wine and crates of fruit could be loaded on the train for shipment. A combination car carried passengers and minor freight. The San Ramon Valley Railroad lasted for just 10 years. The coming of Prohibition ended the principal financial benefit. Trucks were now able to carry the produce to market. In 1922, Samuel died and his nephew, B.J. Feinbaum, took control. With the crash in 1929, the financial crisis hit Val Tice Valley property and it was in desperate state. With his help of his uncle, Walter Arnstein, they formed the Tice Valley Land Company. Its sole purpose was to sell the, sell the land. 
Here enters R. Stanley Dollar. Dollar had a ranch near Martinez, but was looking for other property for a private retreat. In 1930, R. Stanley Dollar purchased the 240 hundred acres of Naphtali Ranch. So after 56 years, the Naphtalis were no longer a part of the Rossmore picture. In our next program, we will talk about the dollars and the arrival of Ross Cortese and the beginning of Rossmore as we know it. Thank you for your attention.